urge, which in the eleventh year of the last king's reign was light, and had indeed against us passed, but that the scambling and unquiet time did push it out of farther question. But my lord, how shall we resist it now? Uh, it must be thought on. If it pass against us, we lose the better half of our possession. For all the temporal lands which men devout by testament have given to the church, would they strip from us, being valued thus, as much as would maintain. This would drink deep. Twould drink the cup and all. But what prevention? The king is full of grace and fair regard. Oh, and a, whole, and a true lover of the holy church. Oh, the courses of his youth promised it not. The breath no sooner left his father's body, but that his wildness mortified in him, seemed to die too, yea, at that very moment. Consideration like an angel came and whipped the offending Adam out of him, leaving his body as a paradise to envelop and contain celestial spirits. Never was such a sudden scholar made. Never came reformation in a flood with such a heady currents, scouring faults nor never hydra-headed willfulness so soon did lose his seat, and all at once is in this king. Well, the strawberry grows underneath the nettle, and wholesome berries thrive and ripen best, neighbored by fruit of baser quality. Mm -hmm. And so the prince obscured his contemplation under a veil of wildness, which no doubt grew like the summer grass, fastest by night, unseen, yet crescive in his faculty. It must be so. For miracles are ceased, and therefore we must needs admit the means how things are perfected. Yes, my good lord, but how now for mitigation of the bill urged by the commons? Doth his majesty incline to it or no? He seems indifferent, or rather swaying more upon our part than cherishing the exhibitors against us. For I have made an offer to his majesty upon our spiritual convocation, and in regard of causes now in hand, which I have opened to his grace at large as touching France, to give a greater sum than ever at one time the clergy, yet gave to his predecessors part with all. How did this offer seem received, my lord? With good acceptance of his majesty, say that there was not time enough to hear, as I perceived his grace would fain have done, the severals and unhidden passages of his true titles to some certain dukedoms, and generally to the crown and seat of France, derived from Edward, his great-grandfather. What was the impediment that broke this off? The French ambassador, upon that instant, craved audience. And the hour, I think, is come to give her hearing. Is it four o'clock? It is. Then go we in to know her embassy, which I could with a ready guess declare before the Frenchmen speak a word of it. I long to hear it, and I will wait upon you. Call in the ambassador, my lady. Not yet, my cousin. We will be resolved before we hear from them of some things of weight to task our thoughts concerning us and France. God and his angels guard your sacred throne and make you long become it. We thank you. My learned lord, we pray you to proceed and justly and religiously unfold why the law of Salic that they have in France or should or should not bar us in our claim. And God forbid that you should fashion rest or bow your reading or nicely charge your understanding soul with opening titles miscreate, whose right suits not in native colors with the truth. For God doth know how many now in health shall drop their blood in approbation of what your reverence shall incite us to. Therefore take heed how you unpawn our person, how you awake our sleeping sword of war. We charge you in the name of God, take heed, for never to such kingdoms did contend without much fall of blood, whose guiltless drops Every one a woe, a sore complaint against him whose wrong gives edge unto the sword. Under this conjuration, speak, my lord, for we will hear, note, and believe in heart that what you speak is in your conscience washes pure as sin with baptism. Then hear me, gracious sovereign, and you peers, that owe yourselves, your lives, and services to this imperial throne. There is no bar to make against your highness's claim to France except this which they produce from Pharamon. In terum salicum mulieris ni succedent. No woman should succeed in salic land, which salic land the French unjustly glows to be the realm of France, and Pharamon the founder of this law and female bar. Yet their own authors, 
faithfully affirm that the land Salic is in Germany between the floods of Sala and of Elbe, where Charles the Great, having subdued the Saxons, they are left behind and settle certain French, who holding in disdain the German women for some dishonest manners of their lives, establish then this law to wit. No female should be in heretrix in Salic land, which Salic, as I said, twixt Elb and Salic is at this day in Germany called Meisen. Then doth it well appear that the land Salic, that the Salic law was not devised for the realm of France. May I with right and conscience make this claim? The sin upon my headdress, sovereign. For in the book of Numbers is it writ, when the man dies, let the inheritance descend unto the daughter. Gracious Lord, stand for your own. Unwind your bloody flag. Look back into your mighty ancestors. Go, dread sovereign, to your great-grandsire's tomb, from whom you claim, invoke his warlike spirit and your great uncles. Edward the Black Prince, who on the French crown played a tragedy, making defeat on the full power of France, whilst his most mighty father on a hill stood smiling to behold his lion's whelp forage in the blood of French nobility. Oh, noble English, that could with half their forces entertain the full pride of France, and let another half Stand laughing by, all out of work and cold for action. Awake remembrance of these valiant dead, and with your puissant arm renew their feats. You are their heir, you sit upon their throne. The blood and courage that renowned them runs in your veins. And my thrice puissant liege is in the very May morn of his youth, ripe for exploits and mighty enterprises. Your brother kings and monarchs of the earth, you all expect that you should rouse yourself as did the former lions of your blood. They know your grace hath cause and means and might. So hath your highness. Never king of England had nobles richer and more loyal subjects, whose minds have left their bodies here in England and lie pavilioned in the fields of France. Oh, let their bodies follow, my dear liege, with blood and sword and fire to win your right. In aid whereof, we of the spirituality will raise your highness such a mighty sum as never did the clergy at one time bring into any of your ancestors. Call in the ambassador sent from the Dauphin. Now are we well persuaded, and by God's help and yours, the noble sinews of our power, France being ours, we'll bend it to our own, or break it all to pieces. <laughs> Now are we well persuaded to know the pleasure of our fair cousin Dauphin, for we hear your greeting is from him, not from the king. <coughs> Please, your majesty, that we speak freely to render what we have in charge, or should we sparingly show you far of the Dauphin's meaning and our embassy? We are no tyrant, but a Christian king, unto whose grace our passion is as subject, as are our wretches, better than our prison. Therefore, with frank and uncurved plaints, tell us <coughs> your friend's mind. Thus then, in a few, your highness lately sending into France did claim some certain dukedoms in the right of your great predecessor, King Edward III, in answer which claim the prince, our master, says that you savor too much of your use. And bid you be advised there is not in France that can be with a nimble gallard one you cannot revel into dukedoms there. He therefore sends you meet her for your spirit this ton of treasure. And in lieu of this desires you let the kingdoms that you claim hear no more of you. This the Dauphin speaks. What treasure, uncle? Tennis balls, my <laughs> lady. <laughs> we are glad the Dauphin is so pleasant with us. His present and your pains, we thank you for it. We have matched our rackets to these balls, and we will in France, by God's grace, play a set. <laughs> Shall strike his father's crown into the hazard. Yes. Tell the Dauphin that he hath made a match with such a ring that all the courts in France shall be disturbed with chafing. And we understand him well how he comes o'er us with our wilder days. 
not measuring what use we made of them. We never valued this poor seed of England, and therefore living hence, to give ourselves to barbarous license, as tis ever common that men are marries when they are from home. But tell the Dauphin I will keep my sin, be like a king, and show my sale of greatness when I do rouse me in my throne of France. <laughs> for that I have laid by my majesty and plotted like a man for working days. But I will rise there with so full a glory that I will dazzle all the eyes of France. Yea, strike the Dauphin blind to look on us. And tell the pleasant prince that this mock of his hath turned his balls to gunstones. <laughs> and his soul shall stand sore charged for the wasteful vengeance shall fly with them. For many a thousand widows, this mock shall mock out of their dear husbands, mock mothers from their sons, mock castles down. Yes. And some are yet ungotten and unborn that shall have cause to curse the Dauphin's scorn. But this all lies within the will of God, to whom I do appeal, and in whose name tell you the Dauphin, I am coming. Yes to avenge me as I may, and to put forth my rightful hand in well hallowed cause. Be you therefore hence in peace. But tell the Dauphin his jest shall savor but of shallow wit, when thousands weep more than did laugh. <coughs> Convey them with safe conduct, fare you well. This was a merry message. We hope to make the sender blush at it. <laughs> Therefore, my lords, omit no happy hour that may give furtherance to our cause. For we have now in us no thought but friends, save those to God that go before our purpose. For God before will chide this Dauphin at his father's door. Therefore, let every man now task his thought that this fair action may on foot be brought. Yes.